Welcome to Southridge. My name is Daniel Carpenter, and I serve as the lead pastor here at Southridge Church. If you'd like to learn more about Southridge, what we believe, how we live, and what all is going on in the life of our church, you can find all of that on our website at southridgechurch.net. If you would like to contribute financially to the work of ministry that's happening here at Southridge, you can do so on our website at southridgechurch.net slash give. Using the drop down menu on that page, you can contribute directly to the church or to one of our targeted giving funds like missions and benevolence. When you contribute in one of those ways, you are partnering with us to help bring the gospel to the ends of the world and to provide care and compassion for the more vulnerable members of our community. All right, well, it's time for the sermon. I hope that you are blessed by the message you hear today. All right, well, good morning again, everybody. Again, uh, for those who might be a guest this morning, my name is Justin. I'm one of the pastors here at the church. Uh, my role on staff is overseeing our community groups, Bible studies. The thing that really lights me up in ministry is just talking about discipleship or spiritual formation. Uh, and that's the kind of language we use, at least in this environment, right? In a church environment, you expect to hear words like discipleship or spiritual formation. Uh, outside of this environment, I like to use the language, what matters most? You know, what matters most to God? What matters most to me? What matters most to uh, believers as a whole? What is it that matters most? That's the kind of language I use in conversation or uh, even when posting on social media, things like that. And there's a, there's a lot of reasons why this phrase, what matters most, appeals to me. Uh, one of the reasons is that the primary lie that I'm tempted to believe in my mind is that I don't matter to God or others. Again, that's the lie that I'm tempted to believe. I'm tempted to believe things like, well, what I do in life is what matters most to God and others, or what I accomplish in life is what matters most to God and others. Um, what other people might say about me or think about me, that's what matters most. Or what I have is, is what matters most. Again, I'm tempted to believe a lot of things matter more to God and others, but that I don't matter. But like I said during the child dedication earlier this morning, one of the mindsets that really turned me around in this is recognizing that I was created by God, created in the image of God, created for the glory of God. And I believe that about me, and I believe that about all of you here today, that you have been created by God and in the image of God and for the glory of God. Now, outside of using this phrase, what matters most, just to talk about personal identity and how God sees us, I also believe that the scriptures reveal to us what matters most to God. So as we read the text, as we study uh, the biblical text, it's an opportunity for us to recognize, okay, these are the things that matter most to God, and then we have to check ourselves. We're going to have to check ourselves and say, okay, am, am I living... You know, I'm going to have to examine my own heart, my own mind, my own soul. Am I living out the values that matter most to God? Am I living out of Christ-likeness? Am I growing in order to more fully reflect to the world what matters most to Jesus? So we're going to be taking the opportunity to read through uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, the second half of it here in just a few minutes. But before we get there, I want to just give a little bit of background as to uh, uh, highlight some things that Pastor Daniel mentioned last week as he started this message series, as well as just give some more insight on the biblical text. And I want to start off with this, is just acknowledge that there are a lot of themes all throughout the scriptures. But biblical scholars often break down the scriptures into just two different themes. And uh, you would think, okay, well, those themes are good and evil, but those aren't the two themes that scholars break it down into. So you might think, okay, well, it's, it's love and hate or, or love and fear, uh, but those aren't the two themes that scholars break it down into either. All of those are very apparent all throughout the biblical text, but the two themes that come up most often our empire versus shalom, or to try to use it in more English language, like uh, power and authority and prestige versus peace. Shalom is the Hebrew word for peace, but uh, it means so much more than that. It's kind of hard to translate it all into the English language. 
So we see this in the scriptures, uh, beginning in the book of Exodus. The people of God were slaves in the Egyptian empire, and God led them out of slavery into a life of peace. In fact, if you look at the uh, Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, it begins with God saying, I'm the God who led you out of slavery in an empire, and here's how you can live in order to live a life of peace. Later in the Old Testament, we see the Assyrian Empire and the Babylonian Empire uh, come into it. And in some cases, God used those empires in order to draw his people back to himself, not so that they would go out and try to have their own empire and look for their own power, but he was bringing them back into a life of peace and resting and trusting in him. And as we get into 1 Peter, this is the time, of course, of the Roman Empire. They were the neighborhood bully at that point in time. When Peter wrote this letter, uh, Emperor Nero was the uh, Caesar for Rome. And uh, as you can guess, Christianity did not have any kind of a foothold or a stronghold on culture as a whole. In fact, it was just the opposite. Those who professed faith in Jesus at this point in time were very much persecuted or at the very least ridiculed from all sides. They were ridiculed from the people, uh, from you know, the Romans. They were ridiculed from their family of origin. And they were ridiculed from those who uh, remained faithful to God but didn't really believe in Jesus, that Jesus was the Messiah who was written about in the Old Testament, which means they didn't really remain faithful to God. Now, let's bring this back around to more of the uh, what matters most language, right? Think about in Peter's day, did those who followed Jesus in Peter's day, did they like being persecuted? Of course not, right? No. But for Peter, what mattered most was not them fighting back against the Roman Empire. Instead, what mattered most was having them grow and enduring their suffering and doing so for the glory of God. Did those who live in the days of 1 Peter, when he wrote this, did they like the fact that there was a, a flag for the Roman Empire that was flying outside? No, they did not like that at all. But, and this is in the text for today, what mattered most to Peter was reminding followers of Jesus that they are the ones who are foreigners or strangers and aliens in the land. Listen, this is really important for us to get because culturally speaking, when we recognize the history of everything that's happening here in 1 Peter, and we try to put that in our context to today, it can really chafe up against us quite a bit. Like the Christians in Peter's day, we can lose sight of what matters most. For example, we might be tempted today to focus more time and more energy trying to instill Christian values upon our culture without actually allowing God to work deep beneath the surface in our own lives. Here's another way to say this. I saw this quote from pastor and author Rich Velotis recently. He said, evangelical Christianity in the United States is often characterized by a deep desire to have Christianity pervade our culture, but not have Christ permeate our being. That's a challenging quote to read through, and it might be one that you have to wrestle with uh, quite a bit. He's, he's basically saying, hey, evangelical Christians in the United States today can be seen as wanting to have more power in the culture without actually having Christ permeate our being. And again, these are really difficult topics, and they, uh, they create difficult questions that we have to wrestle with in life, but they are worth wrestling with, wrestling with. And I think Peter was really fighting up against a similar mindset in his day and age. For Peter, what mattered most wasn't a cultural agenda. What mattered most wasn't a political agenda. What mattered most was not about which party was or wasn't in power. There are some in our culture today who believe that the outcome of the upcoming election is what matters most. 
But for Peter, he reveals to us that while these things certainly do impact and shape our lives, we ought not live as if they are the ones who matters most. They are the things that matter most. I recognize, by the way, we have people politically who are uh, either left of center or right of center here today. And at Southridge, we kind of acknowledge that we are equal opportunity offenders here. Uh, The scriptures rub up against us no matter what our political background might be. So I really think that followers of Jesus, we do well to seek peace, not power or empower or empire. What matters most is abiding in Jesus, allowing his ways to permeate our being, surrendering ourselves over to him. That's what has the greatest impact in our lives and in the lives of others around us. And I recognize that's a really long introduction, but I think it was helpful to ensure that we have a good understanding of Peter, the history, the background, and that gives some foundation for the message he was encouraging followers of Jesus to live. I wanted to do it in a way that really aligns with our current uh, context in our culture. So with that said, I want to read through the second half, or at least part of it, uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 here this morning. So for all who are able, go ahead and stand with me at this time for the reading of God's Word. This is uh, select verses from chapter 1, verses 13 through 24. Peter writes, So think clearly and exercise self-control. Look forward to the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say you must be holy because I am holy." And remember that the heavenly Father to whom you pray has no favorites. He will judge or reward you according to what you do. So you must live in reverent fear of Him during your time as foreigners in the land. You were cleansed from your sins when you obeyed the truth, so now you must show sincere love to each other as brothers and sisters. Love each other deeply with all of your heart, for you have been born again not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last forever because it comes from the eternal living Word of God. This is the Word of God for the people of God. You all can be seated at this time. So uh, just to let you know, we're not going to be able to cover everything in this passage here today. My encouragement to you all is to take opportunity to read and study through 1 Peter as we are uh, going through the text over the upcoming weeks here. Have a good study Bible to read through. Uh, my study Bible of choice is the, the Life Application Study Bible, but I've got probably five or six of them I refer to regularly, but that's just kind of my go-to. Uh, anyway, I got two main objectives here for the message, and uh, those two objectives are first, I want to make sure that we look at what the text does say and what it doesn't say. But I think sometimes we can look at the text and we can walk away thinking we have an understanding of what it's saying, but we can walk away with a completely incorrect understanding. And then at the end of the message, I really want to steer us back to how we live kind of language, what matters most kind of language. So we'll look at what it says, what what it doesn't say, and then focus on how we live as a result. The first passage I want to focus on comes from verses 15 and 16, and I think that for many of us it kind of jumps off the page when you're reading through 1 Peter. It says, but now you must be holy in everything you do, just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. So last week in Pastor Daniel's message, he really introduced the series well, talking about how God is leading us to have hope and to make sure that our hope is in Jesus. And as 1 Peter continues, Peter reminds followers of Jesus what it says in the Old Testament law, that we are to be holy because God is holy. And again, I think we can read this and walk away with an incorrect understanding of what's being communicated. And this is because uh, holiness is not really a topic that comes up in our everyday lives, in our everyday culture. But those Peter was writing to, they understood the Old Testament understanding of holiness. They understood that holiness was essentially saying that the children of God, 
should bear family likeness to the character of their heavenly Father. That's how they would have understood holiness. Children of God should bear family likeness to the character of their heavenly Father. Those who have professed faith in Jesus, we are now part of the new family of Jesus. As such, we set aside old family values and take on new family values. As we follow the ways of Jesus, we continually find we have to surrender parts of ourselves over to Him over and over and over again. Let me use an image to illustrate this. We have a graphic here. This is uh, from the Mostly Healthy Discipleship material that we uh, provide here on a regular basis. And this is basically a a really quick snapshot of the gospel. Uh, When God created everything in in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, uh, everything was whole. But then, as sin entered the world, uh, the world became a broken and a fractured place. I won't ask for a show of hands, but I'm guessing that we would all recognize that there is brokenness all around us uh, in our world. And then the rest of the scriptures are really about God bringing back what is broken back to making it whole again. Listen up, friends. This is important for us to get. Our culture says pursue power, pursue strength, pursue empire. But in the new family of Jesus, we instead pursue peace. We recognize that when Jesus invites us to following him, he's inviting us to give up that which is part of our brokenness and our identity and to constantly be moving toward wholeness. We, we give up our defensiveness and become approachable. We, we know ourselves. We know who we are. We, we recognize our identity in Jesus. We uh, respond to circumstances around us instead of reacting against circumstances around us. We delight in what is good. Instead of spending more time focusing on what we don't like, we take opportunities to delight. We aren't afraid. We're not living in fear which means we're not just living in such a way that we're um, afraid that we might not be good enough. Instead, we move towards courage, that we do matter to God and others. By the way, it takes a lot more courage in our lives to move toward wholeness than it does to just point out what is broken in the lives of other people. Here's the gist, is when we read 1 Peter and read that we are to be holy because God is holy, here's what it doesn't mean, right? We can have an unhealthy mindset. It does not mean that God demands perfection from you. The text doesn't say that. Uh, It does not mean that, that my behavior or your behavior is what matters most. The text doesn't say that either. God's also not saying you have to do something that's absolutely impossible to do. God isn't really in the habit through the scriptures of asking people to do something that can't be done. Instead, right, so if you would happen to have this mindset that God demands perfection from you, that no matter what, you're always going to fall short, that you're never going to be good enough, that that you're always, always, always going to fall short, you need to know this is not the message of the gospel. So the message of the gospel is this. Right? A healthy mindset says, God longs for me to be whole, and that I can be holy by being holy His. You can see what I did there, a little play on words. You know, some people live their whole lives wondering, what does God want me to do? Anybody ever wonder that? Like, what is it that God wants me to do? Here's some good news for you. All right. If you want to know what God wants from you, here it is. God simply wants you. He wants you to know that He is with you. God wants you to know that He is for you. God wants to bring you into a life of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and so much more. God has been and is right now pursuing you madly because he is madly in love with you and he wants you to experience a life of wholeness, not 
brokenness. What he most desires from you is you. And some people say, okay, yeah, I get that, but what does he want me to do? He wants you to be whole by being wholly his. That's what he wants. Here's the thing is we all have some kind of desire to impact others around us. We have a desire to positively impact our families, those we work with, and the world around us. But the best way that we can do that is by reflecting the integrity and the character and the grace and mercy of our loving Heavenly Father. And we can only do that when we are holy in Him. We can't help others be whole if we're not on the path to becoming whole ourselves. Right? You can't give somebody something that you do not have. In the same way you can't give somebody what you don't have, you can't help others live in wholeness if you're not on a path toward wholeness. So here's a simple question for reflection, or maybe a not so simple question for reflection for you this week. What's one area of your life right now in which God is leading you from brokenness toward wholeness? Right? Just consider, what is one area in your life right now in which God is leading you from brokenness toward wholeness, and how do you know that? How do you, how do you, you know, in what ways do you notice that God is leading you in this area of your life toward wholeness? In what ways are you noticing His presence in this area of your life? Is there anything that you're holding on to that you don't want to surrender over to Him as He's trying to move you in that direction? Again, it's easier for us to point fingers at what we don't like in others or in our culture. But again, this isn't what leads us to wholeness. It's these kinds of questions of really wrestling with what God is doing deep in our own lives that leads us toward wholeness. There's just one other verse I'd like to highlight, and I'm going to do this uh, very quickly here. This morning, I recognize we had the child dedication and a lot of things going on. This is 1 Peter uh, 1, 17b, the second half of the verse. He says, so you must live in reverent fear of him during your time as foreigners in the land. In the same way that we might read that God wants you to be holy and have this unhealthy mindset that God is demanding perfection or he's demanding something that's impossible, some might read this text and walk away with an incorrect understanding as well. The unhealthy mindset here is that God just wants me to be afraid of Him, right? We read it a lot through the Scriptures, and especially in the Old Testament Proverbs about fearing God. Uh, Proverbs 1.7 says, Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge. Proverbs 9.10 says, Fear of the Lord uh, is the foundation of wisdom. But fear of the Lord is not about being afraid. Instead, a healthy mindset when we read about the fear of the Lord is that God wants me to be in awe of Him. Teaching about this topic of the fear of the Lord in a sermon years ago, uh, pastor and author Timothy Keller from New York, he defined the fear of the Lord this way. He said, fear of the Lord is life rearranging, joyful awe and wonder, before the greatness of who God is and what He has done. I really love that definition of the fear of the Lord. Life rearranging, joyful awe and wonder before the greatness of who God is and what He has done. Here's where we're going to land this week. Uh, recently, we wrapped up our membership series here at Southridge Church, and we introduced what is known as a, uh, a rule of life. And a rule of life is essentially what Timothy Keller wrote in this quote, it's coming up with a plan to rearrange your life, to reprioritize how you spend your time and your energy and your resources so you can more fully experience joyful awe and wonder in life before the greatness of God and what He has done. The one area that we've most encouraged people here at Southridge to really begin creating a rule of life just Okay, how are you going to prioritize your life? How are you going to prioritize your time? How are you going to rearrange uh, your time? Is in regard to union with God. So to wrap some how we live language into it, uh, your union with God in a culture 
of distraction and escapism, and we know that our culture loves to throw distractions and give us opportunities to escape from reality in countless ways. Instead, in the new family of Jesus, we accept Jesus' invitation to practice the presence of God through scripture, prayer, silence, and solitude. To put what matters most language into it, we can say that's what matters most. What matters most is practicing the presence of God in scripture, in prayer, in silence, and in solitude. So here's just some recommended practices for you for this week. All right, if we're going to put all of these things out there, uh, solitude. Practice solitude by planning for regular, distraction-free, uninterrupted time with God. Now, I'm going to acknowledge here that when I myself set aside time for solitude with God, sometimes other things pop up into my mind while I'm doing that. I just want you to know that's okay. There's a lot of grace in that, but that doesn't mean I don't want to Practice it. Practice solitude by making time, planning for regular, distraction-free, uninterrupted time with God. Practice silence by experiencing joyful awe and wonder before the greatness of God and what He has done. You can do this in countless ways. One way is you can just go out into nature, maybe even take a picture of nature, and then just slowly Look over that picture, meditate, reflect on it of who God is and what he has made for us. Practice solitude, silence, practice scripture. You can do that by reading through 1 Peter chapter 1. But as we like to say, we don't just talk about reading the scriptures, we want the scriptures to read us. So as you're reading through 1 Peter, allow the scriptures to read you. And then finally, practice prayer by asking God to reveal at least one way he's leading you from brokenness toward wholeness. Perhaps you can even ask God, hey, is there any way that I'm currently pursuing power or empire and not peace in my life? Reveal that to me. Show me the step I can take to move toward peace. Again, these are just some simple recommendations. I just wanted to wrap in the kind of language we've been uh, advocating for here at Southridge Church. You might have other practices that you want to put into place as you experience the presence of God this week, and that's okay. What matters most is, is, you know, just being intentional, saying, hey, I'm going to move from brokenness toward wholeness. I'm going to pursue peace, not power. My prayer for us this week uh, is that we would all experience a deeper wholeness. We would experience peace beyond measure as we really are intentional with our time, our talents, our, our habits, that we would just practice the presence of God all day, every day, recognize that He is present and we can notice His presence with us at any given time. Let me close out with prayer, and then the worship team is going to come forward and close us out with one additional song here today. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your uh, for your word. That uh, we can look at First Peter, and even though we are living in a very different culture and living in a very different context, uh, we can still apply it in our lives, in our culture, in our context. We can recognize the things that mattered most to Peter, and we can say, okay, what matters most to me? Am I living out the values of God in my family, in my workplace, in my culture? Are there any areas in my life where I'm pursuing uh, power, not peace? Is, is there anything else that I uh, am holding on to that, that is keeping me stuck in brokenness instead of releasing it so that I can experience more wholeness? As those who are in your family today, Lord, we just pray that we would go out uh, and live out the, new val- the, the values of Jesus as we are a part of your family that we would be holy because you are holy. And to be holy isn't a call to perfection, but it's simply a call to abide in you. Uh, May we abide in you in all we do here this week. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for listening to today's message. 
If you would like to follow up with one of us about something that you heard today, or if you would like to speak with a pastor for prayer or support, you can contact us through our website at southridgechurch.net. Again, I hope you were blessed by today's message and I hope you have a great day.